What's up, guys? Welcome to another edition of Before the Whistle presented by BRK Insurance Group. If your business is looking for the best in employee benefits, commercial property and casualty insurance, or retirement and 401k plan services, there's no one better suited to meet your challenges and build a plan centered around your needs than BRK Insurance Group. What's going on, y'all? Happy Friday. Welcome back to Before the Whistle. Again, I'm your host, Maddie Hudak. I apologize for this being the only episode that came out this week. Uh, as a lot of you that I, I've watched the show, I assume know, Tulane had their pro day on Tuesday, March 26th, originally was slated to be at Yulman Stadium. Uh, Corey Glor and myself were going to be the broadcasters for that on ESPN Plus up until about an hour before airtime, where unfortunately, if you're from New Orleans, you know that weather weather's here and it's unpredictable and it probably just wasn't the best opportunity for these guys to showcase their strengths with inclement weather so it ended up being moved to the saints facility so unfortunately no espn broadcast but i was awake um it started early this year at 8 a.m so i went over to the saints facility and it was actually kind of nice to be able to watch pro day it kind of struck me just in comparison from last year where it was really exciting to do the broadcast. I'm disappointed that we weren't able to, but I realized that it was kind of hard for me to watch the pro day itself. Uh, we couldn't really see a lot of the drills that were out of our line of sight and save for the kind of small monitors in front of us. At the same time, we're focused on producing a broadcast, whereas I just kind of went to observe these guys and the benefit of pro day really is that it's in this guy, in these guys' backyards, it's at their stadium. Usually their strength coach runs the majority of it. It was going to be primarily conducted by Rusty Witt, the new strength coach, if it was to be held at Yeoman. But when things get moved over to the Saints facility, then the scouts and, and that personnel tend to run it a little bit more. Uh, so that all kind of happened last minute. So it was just interesting to watch how they worked in a different environment. Um, but all that to say, I unfortunately don't really have any of the exact numbers because they just really weren't giving them out very much out loud. And I really can't uh, time a 40-yard dash you see all the scouts really just run to the middle and they decide on a time, but that doesn't always get publicized. So just really my eye check of what I was able to see there and really the benefit of these pro days, including the attendance that we saw from a lot of NFL teams, what that says about these prospects, what that says about Tulane as a program, and I guess any projections that people might like, but I'm going to break that all down here on today's show. And just to give everyone a little bit of a primer on Pro Day, uh, it all kind of gets meddled into all these off-season tests. But just to kind of bring everyone through the dance that is the draft process for these guys, for a lot of them, that starts when the season's over, uh, whether or not they decide to play in the bowl game. And we saw a lot of the guys that ended up participating in Pro Day opt out of the bowl game, including Michael Pratt and Jarius Monroe. To name a few guys, Jaquan Jackson, Lawrence Keyes, a lot of guys who just really weren't healthy at that point. Uh, and when you're trying to prepare for these off-season events, if you will, the ones that kind of matter a lot are really earlier on than you might think. For guys for the Senior Bowl, it's really at the end of January. And so that late December bowl game, early, almost early January at that, if you're still nursing injuries in case you incur another one, you really don't have that much time uh, in order to get healthy. And as these events have kind of come on uh, throughout this off season and just knowing these guys and seeing a lot of them go throughout several ones of these different processes, it sticks out that a lot of them seem to be very similar, but there definitely is nuance there because obviously there's a reason that all of these events are held. I think that there's the unignorable component of the fact that the NFL is one of the best sources of entertainment for people and that entertainment has to really continue when the season's over. Um, as much as we are all missing football, we're still talking about quite a bit of football, looking at it from the draft side on both sides of the coin. So I, I, you're just kind of used to that really being a year-round thing. And I think these events really just help drum up that interest, but they're not just putting them on to initiate these guys into a frat and seeing how they you know, interact with guys. It is all really important, but... You can see a lot of traits in these guys, tangibles and intangibles. And then just a lot of the testing really helps solidify the things that these guys are able to see on film. So the senior bowl is really early on in this process at the end of January. Like I said, we saw Michael Pratt and Jaquan Jackson both go there and you could really do a lot for yourself with that type of exposure. And it showed me more than anything that it's really important just how you conduct yourself on the field during the senior bowl. Uh, it really is just not that pretty of a product at the end of the day. 
where there's been some years that the quarterbacks have found chemistry a little sooner uh, than other years. But at the end of the day, it's a bunch of guys that have never played together before and are all trying to better their future and still trying to be a good teammate to these guys, especially for quarterbacks who don't want to be that guy that is throwing guys a bad football. Um, so really, how do you handle all that? And for the quarterbacks, I pointed this out during the senior bowl, but the way that Michael Pratt went around to all the wide receivers, even the running backs, even if they weren't catching the ball, they were just lining up there with him, but having his arm around the guys and really just making that effort to be a teammate to a bunch of strangers. Because at the end of the day, all of these guys are going on to a team that is going to be all strangers for them. Um, And especially at that quarterback role, even if you're not necessarily slotting into that starting position, it still is the ultimate leading role. It's where all guys really just look to for guidance and quarterbacks that get drafted, the median age of a team is going to be a lot higher than that guy walking into that room. And so the ability to conduct yourself among strangers with all these scouts and coaches in attendance, I think really bodes well for these guys. Uh, it's a lot different. And then you have the East West Shrine Bowl, which also offers a lot of that same ability. I just it's held a little, little farther away and concurrently with the senior bowl, but Jarius Monroe was there and he was the MVP of the East West Shrine bowl for his team with that interception. So not to discount that at all. Uh, there's just so much in the off season at this point. And then you get onto the combine where Tulane had the highest number of G five players invited with Michael Pratt, Jaquan Jackson, and then one of the offensive linemen, Prince Pines. And so we saw guys do a little bit of the testing there. We saw Michael Pratt, do the vertical jump and the broad jump. And if I remember correctly, let me pull up his numbers. Uh, his 36 inch vertical was the highest among the quarterbacks and was tied for first with his 20 yard shuttle. So he didn't end up running the 40 yard dash. The 40 yard dash, um, I think it matters. And then sometimes it gets overemphasized for skill positions, especially, you know, you see the speed on tape, but they really want to be able to validate what their eyes are seeing on film. You know, these guys look fast, they play fast, but you're ultimately gauging you know, what your eyes are seeing on film, sometimes uh, your eyes in games. But, you know, I might think a player runs fast and then I look at their 40 time and I'm a little bit surprised. And sometimes that's just the nature of this testing. And something about the combine, at least, that sticks out in contrast from the pro day is I don't know how many times they got on the 40 yard dash, but it was certainly more than twice. And you really only get one or two opportunities in those drills when you're at the combine. And so if you have a bad start you get one more opportunity if you look at Jaquan Jackson he ran a 4.54 on his first 40 yard dash and then a 442 on his second one that's a really a significant split but you know it just goes to show how different a guy can look on one versus two runs I mean that just really puts him in an entirely different conversation and you just look at a lot of the guys at the combine and how much pressure that is and I think sometimes it's not the worst thing to opt out of it I found it really just fascinating this year where unfortunately the entertainment aspect of it does kind of require these guys to participate in a lot of these events but you saw a little bit more of these players kind of take back control over their draft process and you might feel one way or the other about it but as someone that's been able to now follow along through two off seasons where two lane players have gotten considerable draft attention uh it just really humanizes the entire process for me and how much goes into just these one days and one event for months at a time that could make or break your life. And it, it just feels different when I'm looking at it from this side versus when I used to primarily just cover the saints, cover NFL and looked at prospects based on their traits and their traits only. And a lot of the time that's all you can do. And for the most part, that is what gets you onto a roster uh, drafted onto the field. But if that was the case, then there really wouldn't be this need for all these in-person events for all these top 30 visits. I mean, you just need to be able to see how guys interact with their teammates and you don't really get that at the combine. It really is just that testing. And, you know, look at the gauntlet drill, for example, where the wide receiver runs through and he has to change direction, catches a bunch of passes from the quarterback standing there. You've always seen those broadcasts. I remember, I think it was Steve Smith at one point went down to the quarterbacks and kind of scolded them because they were just throwing these absolute darts and they were just really burning holes in the wide receiver's hands and it's not necessarily their fault. It just speaks to the pressure of them really wanting to audition and make really strong throws, but the wide receiver is just trying to get through this drill. And so that really is something that you see at the combine. I remember at Tulane's pro day last year, Kai Horton and Carson Haggard, both 
were the ones that were throwing for these guys because it really wasn't about the quarterback. And so they just really didn't want to put any of that undue focus on, you know, Michael Pratt, who wasn't declaring for the draft, but it would just kind of detract from all that where, yeah, at Tulane's Pro Day this year, Michael Pratt was the star of the show and that's how quarterbacks go. And that's how schools get a lot of attention that ends up sustaining forward. But what stuck out to me more than anything was the fact that it really just proved the importance of last year and why sustaining success is so important. And I'm going to get to that in a little bit, but it felt last year like this really exciting thing that all of these teams showed up and it almost just felt very normalized this year to see the amount of teams in attendance and the amount of guys that were able to participate in pro day. I think I counted this before and now I don't have it off of the top of my head, but I want to say it was something like 16 prospects and only three of those guys got invited to the combine. Only three of them, Jarius Monroe and then Michael Pratt and Jaquan Jackson got invited to these showcases. So really for a lot of these guys, since the season ended, it's just been preparing for this one day. And it was a day that they originally anticipated being their final time at Yulman Stadium. And then really last minute, getting moved to the Saints facility. And that's not the end all be all, but it, it's just, there's something to be said about being used to an event and looking forward to really having that one last ride with your guys. But I think that's really more than anything. It's just being able to catch that last pass from Michael Pratt. It's being able to do this bench press while being cheered on by your teammates. I, I just, pro day to me is the most favorable event to the players. And I think in an, an off season process where they essentially have no control and really don't ever gain any, including throughout the draft process, where the only guys who might actually have a, a locus of control in this are the guys that get are, that aren't drafted and are able to maybe make their choice signing with the team. Otherwise, these guys are at the mercy of this process and at the mercy of the draft order of what 32 teams trying to operate at the exact same time with all of their different brains and thought processes and decision-making and how that really just spits these guys out like a, a top at just random locations. And so having a day where I think the players have a little more control, a little more familiarity, and it's able to showcase their strengths and their ceiling, you, you can see on tape when a player does bad and when a player does well. You can see how they perform in those types of critical moments. But I think you really want to see these guys in their last minute or your last observation of them, say for those private workouts, what you really want to see as their ceiling. And you get a lot of chance to see these intangibles at pro day that you might not necessarily get, you know, at the senior bowl, unless you're lucky enough to be one of the coaches that is looking at these guys. And, you know, that's something to think about as well. Just the amount of coaches that were around both Michael Pratt and Jaquan Jackson um, with the way that the senior bowl does their coaching staff. Um, but the scouts and the coaches that show up to pro day, you know, they have the ability to have these guys do specific things. And unlike the combine, unlike, the senior bowl for the most part these guys are being specifically sent to these schools to look at a, a player or two in specific it's rarely at this point in the in, in the program just head on down to new orleans and see if anyone at tooling stands out it's usually that you're doing your follow-up work on the guys that you've been following throughout this offseason process or for the guys uh, especially in that defensive back room that I really want to get to on this episode as well lance robinson jarius monroe cam pettislow aj ham there's just so many of them um this is really the first time that they've been able to have that kind of one-on-one -on -one conversation with them and have those workouts with those guys. And especially for those DBs, that skill position, it just, the 40 yard dash, it matters more for them. It's something that might have a defensive back be looking at needing to change into being a safety in order to get onto a roster or for a guy that's on the cusp that might be shorter, a guy like Lance Robinson, for example, oh, he runs a really good 40 yard dash. You, you have a really good vertical. I mean, it's really for the most part about being able to locate the high point. And you've seen some more shorter cornerbacks actually kind of be able to make it in the NFL. You have to be able to jump high and still have that kind of coverage ability. But when you get that kind of combination of play IQ of explosiveness that you can also see in the broad jump and then that speed in the 40 yard dash, I talked about this on WWL radio with Bobby. Uh, I'm sorry, with Mike Dettelier yesterday, I want to say talking about Lance Robinson, for example, where those kind of things just validate what you see on film. I always think back to that Adrian Martinez open field tackle he made in that Kansas State win in 2022, where he was on the complete opposite side of the field and the amount of ground he made up for, the angle that he took and just the timing 
and the willingness to wrap up a really big run first quarterback at his size and decidedly throw him back for a tackle. I mean, these defensive backs are just very impressive that come out of Tulane and their ability to just stop guys that are way bigger than they are because they work on a lot of that fundamental technique and tackling, but they're also just not scared of the moment. And pro day for them is really that last opportunity to show that they're not scared of the moment. They're not scared of testing and stacking up against what these guys have seen now at the combine and are really looking to validate for them one way or another. And the responsiveness to coaching, the ability to take what these coaches are asking them to do in those drills and hear it and be able to exemplify that relatively quickly. That's where you really see the benefit of pro day, especially for those defensive guys. For the offensive guys, it's just a completely different story than what you saw at, you know, the senior bowl and those throwing drills where Michael Pratt, he had just the guys that he's used to throwing to. And then on their end, it helps them out as well. They're not getting thrown to by a guy that, yes, Michael Pratt is trying to get drafted. But the thing about Michael Pratt is he's a great teammate first and foremost and a great leader more than anything. And you just know that equal if not his utmost important thing going in there was making everyone around him look better and you could see that in the way that he was throwing the football it was perfect timing it was with great touch and that's something that if I was going to look at what I would have knocked him for a few seasons back it would have been a little bit of just kind of the fastballs that he was throwing in the 21 years so the ability to put touch on, on long throws at all three levels of the field is something that you could see from Michael Pratt but you know, for guys like Jaquan Jackson, it's it just a chance to show what they can do downfield and fully healthy at that. Um, You know, they were all kind of hurt here and there throughout last season. And I think by the time you get to late March, you really get to see these guys as healthy as they're going to be throughout this process. And, you know, for someone like Lawrence Keyes, who hadn't played a game since... I want to say the conference championship, if not Tulsa, uh, he was someone that was really looking to get back for the military bowl. And then just unfortunately wasn't able to get up to full strength and wasn't invited to those events. So for him to be able to show his route running ability and his ability to locate the ball, turn around and catch it in stride, that really helps him out. And knowing that they have that chemistry going in, it just puts all the guys at ease. Um, and you know, everyone that Michael Pratt was throwing to, it was guys that he had relationships with. So in addition to Jaquan Jackson and Lawrence Keyes, you also had Chris Carter, who was a tight end for Tulane that really stepped up in a lot of critical moments last year. He wasn't used that much as a pass catcher, but when he was, there was this massive catch he made in Memphis. It was something like a 19 yard reception on first and 18. And it just almost went over his head and it was a one-handed catch. I saw him make an extremely crazy, I want to say it was one-handed as well, catch in the end zone at FAU where he just barely got his toes in. And you could see really what he could do as a red zone threat. So to be able for him to get out there and cast, catch some passes from Michael Pratt, running back Shedro Lewis, where, you know, what are running backs really supposed to do at pro day, if not show off what they can do as a receiver? I mean, you can have them run however you want, but there's literally nothing but maybe cones and you could have guys standing there for them to go off of. but being able to show that you can be a threat as a receiver really helps those guys as well. And then Fat Watts, who is a player that has been really impressive to watch throughout Tulane spring camp. You just think back to how many years Michael Pratt has spent throwing to him as well. And so he comes, helps out these guys, Jalen McCluskey, uh, coach at JJ McCluskey of Tulane's son who played at Tulane. Uh, he was on the practice squad of the Saints the year of the quarterback competition. I really liked what I saw out of him. I was disappointed that he wasn't kept around. And he really looked well in those workouts as well. So you just saw what Michael Pratt could do downfield. And you just saw all these guys in their element. And that's really what I think sticks out about Pro Day more than anything else. That, you know, you get a little bit more specialized attention. You get to see genuine interest from these teams. And when you're asked to do these specific things, really get a chance to perform and impress and make that lasting impression. But you also get that one last opportunity being a teammate with these guys that you've now gone through the highs with the lows with for a lot of these guys, it was several seasons long and you get all that emotion. And it's just really special in a way that these other events just simply don't provide. <laughs> it's easy to hear a promo in the middle of a podcast and think, of course they like the product they're paid to. Well, if you know me at all, then you know, two things. One, I'm truthful, almost to a fault. And two, if I were in it for the money, I would certainly be doing something else. So believe me when I say that I love Blue Oak Barbecue. The food, the drinks, the people, the location, yes, all of that. 
Lua Oak Barbecue has a great selection of your favorites from the smoker, fantastic sides, and awesome bar specials each and every week, including one for a good cause this time. Go check them out. Blue Oak Barbecue, located at 900 North Carrollton here in New Orleans, or visit them online at blueoakbarbecue.com. I've ran through the majority of the March specials and, you know, March is uh, coming to an end as 2024 continues to fly by. But what I want to promote today is something that also is here for a good cause. If y'all are familiar with Hogs for a Cause, it's an event here, I believe it's April 5th through 6th, if I'm correct. And all of the proceeds go to pediatric brain cancer, something that goes on every year. And Blue Oak Barbecue has a drink where $5 of every sale goes to Hogs for the Cause. And that's their $10 cow tipper, Cherry Bob, which is made with Oxbow right, white rum, lemonade, and a cherry puree. I was there a few weeks ago trying out a few little concoctions for a drink we have coming up in the pipeline. And when I continue to emphasize how much of a mixologist MJ Lloyd really is, any drink that I'm promoting here is truly one worth trying. But when one it has as much of a good cause wrapped up in it, just go get yourself one of those cow tipper cherry bombs. So I've been going on radio over the last week, just kind of breaking down Tulane's Pro Day and building off of this, obviously. On today's episode, uh, one of the things that just struck me as I was preparing to talk both on ESPN New Orleans with Gus Kattengale and then, as I mentioned earlier, with uh, Mike Dettelier on WWL, was just the fact that it wasn't a surprise this year that there were all these teams in attendance where last year was the first time in school history that all 32 NFL teams had someone in attendance at Tulane. And it, it just felt like this historic thing building off of the Cotton Bowl win, the greatest single season turnaround in college football history, and that really being bolstered and I think validated to an extent by all of these showings at Tulane's Pro Day, where it just felt like last that last season, that Cotton Bowl year, we were having to scream for the, from the mountaintops that these guys are worth taking a look at, that Tajay Spears is indeed a generational talent. And we're seeing that really play out in the NFL this year. And it's hard to ignore the effect of that and just the sustaining of success in seeing the turnout this year at Pro Day, where Jim Nagy from the Senior Bowl was there. He was the one that kind of tweeted out this attendance. So it was 28 of the 32 NFL teams there, but you had assistant general managers from the Raiders and the Dolphins. You had quarterback coaches from the Cowboys, the Jets, and the Raiders. And you had wide receiver coaches from the Titans and the Broncos. Um, that is just, again, having assistant GMs in addition to multiple quarterback coaches and multiple wide receiver coaches. You can really see, again, the writing on the wall of the importance of having a quarterback that they're looking at in the draft. And you've seen these teams like, the Jets, the Raiders, the Dolphins, the Broncos, those teams really all make sense for a guy like Michael Pratt. The Denver situation is obvious. I think Jared Stidham is over there with, I'm not really entirely sure who else. And the the Dolphins, I think having someone that fits a similar skill set in a way to Tua and having the receivers that they do in Miami, it would be such a fun system to develop and learn in. But Tua is someone that has gone down a couple times over the last two years and doesn't really have, you know, kind of that successor behind him. I know that they've had backups here and there, but I think teams are really seeing that you need to start developing these quarterbacks earlier than you might think. Just looking at the way that injuries went last season, where you look at the teams like the Jets and the Raiders having an interest in someone like Michael Pratt, where all their season dreams for the Jets rested on a quarterback in Aaron Rodgers that literally went down in week one of the NFL season. And I think a quarterback room that they largely ignored past that really got put on display for them early on in the year. And yeah, Zach Wilson, his prowess aside, um, it, clearly they really weren't ready for what would happen if Aaron Rodgers went down and so swiftly at that. But you just looked at last year, um, Aiden McConnell, O'Connell, I'm missing it now, the guy from Purdue that ended up ending the season as a starting quarterback for the Raiders after they sat Jimmy Garoppolo. There's just a lot of teams whose quarterback situations are absolutely haywire right now. And I don't pretend, like I said, at any point that I am a quarterback guru and I just don't really watch that much quarterback tape because it's not a position group that I feel comfortable evaluating at this point. To really say that I have this ranking, this order for guys going in one team or the other or which round what have you I think you could probably project for most positions what round they're going to end up going in but quarterback is such a chaotic position it's 
the most important position on the team. And it's one that a lot of teams are really looking at as not a want, but a need. And then you look on the other side where it's less about injury, but it's just more about the value of continuing to evaluate quarterbacks is the 49ers. I continue to look at them. I think it would be a great landing spot for someone like Michael Pratt to develop at as well, where having an offense that is designed around them, but it just really requires their ability to execute it, read defenses, just something that we all know Michael Pratt can do. Sorry, my Ram just came up as, as having space, but the, the fact that you really can believe what they say when they scout these quarterbacks through multiple rounds. Uh, my dad, who still lives in California, filled me in that they recently lost a fifth round draft pick and John Lynch went out there and said, you know, it's really actually disappointing for us. Proceeds to list off the list of guys, including George Kittle, uh, of players that they were drafted in the fifth round. And you really believe them when they say that they're taking every round of the draft seriously. And you can debate till the cows come home about, yeah, he was the last pick in the NFL draft, but there's a reason that they took him with the last pick in the NFL draft, because the second that that pick is over, it's open season for these guys. And as I learned from guys talking throughout the draft draft process last year, you know, they're already on the phone with these teams before the draft is over. And so things can happen in a matter of minutes for these guys. And I think, I don't think teams do this on purpose. Maybe they do. Um, maybe I'm being too nice, but really just the anxiety of not getting drafted and, and wanting to find a home so quickly that you might end up somewhere that might not be the best for you or somewhere that just can make a better offer or guarantee you more. And so there was a reason that the 49ers took Brock Purdy with that last pick rather than a guy that could play on special teams. Um, But they developed him. And maybe that's just playing with the scout team, but he really took the scout team seriously. You see the comments from guys like George Kittle, or I'm sorry, like Fred Warner, I'm m messing things up now, uh, on the defensive side saying that they're, we were really impressed by Brock Purdy, genuinely giving them fits on the scout team, taking that super seriously. And that's something that Michael Pratt might find himself in that situation and that a quarterback gets hurt or they just don't really like the direction that he's going in. And now you have a guy that has made the most of all of his opportunities and is ready to step in and succeed. And the 49ers had that in Brock Purdy. And because they've spent this much time looking at that position, yeah, they got it wrong with Trey Lance. Um, There are, to me, as many busts as there are surprises. When you just look at probability, look at a, a bell curve of people, you know, you're, they're going to have guys on both sides that test really well, that project to go really well in the NFL. And then what the heck happened with them? There are a lot of common factors you can point out along some of them, but a lot of the time it's just bad luck, bad placement of where you're going on a team, a team that isn't really good at developing quarterbacks, might have had a coaching change, a team that trades up in the draft that wasn't necessarily one that you were anticipating going on to and one that might not fit your skill set. You might be asked to step in too early. There's just, there's so many variables that go on in the NFL. Um, but when you look at, a team like the 49ers, they invested three first round draft picks in a quarterback that didn't work out for them. And they said, oh, well, we have this other guy and we're ready to play him. And I, the fact that, yeah, they lost the Super Bowl, but they did it with the last pick in the NFL draft just that year prior, one who came off of an elbow injury, and they still felt confident enough in him to name him the starting quarterback. If teams aren't looking at that, then to me, they're just really failing to use the entirety of the draft to their advantage. And, you know, when I look at these quarterbacks that everyone gets, that's naming, throwing everyone around out there, when you talk about fit, it has to really apply to every single guy that we're talking about in a conversation where you might think that X quarterback is the fourth or third best quarterback in the draft. And then you end up getting surprised when a lower guy gets drafted over him. Well, a lot of the time quarterbacks kind of end up in these archetypes, if you will, of these are the types of guys that we like. And you might like a guy that's in that higher tier, but you might not like the traits of the rest of the guys that are up in that era thing of, of quarterbacks. And that's really where it all comes down to. Yeah, you have the consensus in Caleb Williams. I don't know if there really is a consensus of two, three, four, five, if you will. And obviously media is not the NFL, but there are years where it's plainly obvious which round or, what, or which order the quarterbacks are going in. And I'm not saying that Michael Pratt's going to jump into the first round or, or jump over these guys, but to say that he wouldn't go in round two to me is just something that I can't necessarily rule out. I think that you might see a lot of quarterbacks 
go in the first round this year, just again, based on circumstance and all of the teams that suffered injuries to their quarterbacks and really didn't have that solid of a quarterback room. Um, but a lot of that ends up being uh, trades into the second round as well, where you might be a team that was looking at one of these early round quarterbacks and they end up getting drafted. You're trying to make a trade up. And at that same time, someone jumps you and takes another quarterback that you were looking at. Now, Michael Pratt might not have been the guy that you would have taken initially, but your team needs a quarterback. He is the one that you've identified in that, I guess, second cloud of people, if you will. And so if it's quarterback, you trade up and you get him. You don't run the risk of the fact that someone else could be having the exact same conversation as you behind closed doors. And I think it's a lot easier to get over a whiff of another player than it is to get over the whiff of a quarterback. And so if he goes in round two or three, it really wouldn't surprise me that much at all. Just looking at the teams, again, that have identified interest in Michael Pratt, Jets, Raiders, Dolphins, Broncos, only one of those to me has a surefire situation at quarterback. And not to say these teams are operating out of desperation mode, but I mean, reading the tea leaves, the Jets were at a lot of our practices and a lot of games this year. Really doesn't surprise me that they had guys down there. It doesn't surprise me about the Raiders either. Um, and it doesn't surprise me about the Broncos. And then you think about the fact that Dan Roshar is on Tulane's coaching staff and he was an offensive line coach with the Saints for a really long time. So Sean Payton and the Broncos have as good of information on Michael Pratt than they'll be able to get from anyone. And if you, for example, want a quarterback that is mobile and the mobile guys you were looking at end up getting drafted earlier, that's the position that you reach for more than anything else. So I'll be curious to really see how that goes, but that's really all that I can project at this point. I think as a general thing, most quarterbacks that go on to the NFL and start right away aren't set up in positions to succeed. And that usually applies to those earlier round quarterbacks. But when you are in those later rounds, sometimes you do actually end up going somewhere that might be a better fit for you because these teams aren't as desperate as the ones trying to trade into the top 10 to get you know, their guy. Um, or you might still kind of be evaluated as their second guy, uh, but it really allows, I think, a little better sense of fit to take place where it might not be a team, again, like the Dolphins, where they're not looking for a starting quarterback per se, but every team needs to be prepared if their quarterback goes down. And as we've seen, that can happen as early as the first play of the series in week one for the Jets. And if you don't have QB2 and QB3 ready to go, then you need to be evaluating that in this year's draft. And so teams that might not have taken quarterbacks in earlier years might be looking a little differently at that. And I just don't really understand why teams don't draft quarterbacks every single year. If you can really say that you have identified all guys in rounds you know, one through seven as players that you can really see contributing on your roster, then fine. But if any one of those is a little bit of a throwaway, if you will, to me, I don't understand why you haven't identified a lower round quarterback that you're then going to take and have the opportunity to throw to the scout team to be on the practice squad and just really see what potential that they have because mystery relevant, if you will, is now extremely relevant and no one really cares what round he was taken in. Um, and previously, I feel like the only really good example of that was Tom Brady. And that almost makes it a very impossible conversation to have because no one that we're talking about in these conversations, I don't think anyone should be projecting to be the next Tom Brady because as we saw, Tom Brady wasn't even projected to be the next Tom Brady. Um, does it come down to intelligence? Does it come down to mental processing, decision-making? And how much of that can we really see in these exhibition events? Um, I think, again, you look at critical moments, you look at big moments of competition. And when you have someone like Michael Pratt, you have a guy that in the NIL era, in the transfer portal era, where he might've perhaps gone somewhere and gotten a little more exposure, he decided to really finish it out with the team that he started with. And that isn't lost on a lot of scouts, a lot of coaches that are looking for those intangibles at that quarterback role. And then you look at how he was as a teammate at Pro Day, where all he really did was do the throwing session. You know, he was weighed height and weight at the combine. He hasn't run the 40 yard dash. Like I said, he did the vertical and the broad. Um, and so it was really just that throwing session for him. But just hearing him really encouraging all the guys uh, over at the bench press. I mean, he was right up there. You can hear him um, in a video that Lawrence Keyes' mom posted on Instagram where he got 10 bench reps. I just want to shout that out to Lawrence Keyes. That really was impressive by him. 
you can hear Michael Pratt just cheering him on, getting that last rep. It looked like he was kind of struggling at around eight. And that's when Michael Pratt got louder as a teammate. And quite frankly, he really didn't even have to be there at that point, let alone that active and there for his teammates. But it just speaks to the leader that Michael Pratt is and all of the traits that we've all seen that really truly make him great as a, a player. But the really fun thing this year was it just didn't feel like we had to be that loud about it. He was the first player invited to the senior bowl. Then Jaquan Jackson also gets an invite over there. Then they go over to the combine along with Prince Pines. Jarius Monroe goes to the shrine bowl. And yes, Tajay Spears and Dorian Williams were both invited to the senior bowl and the combine last year, but they were really kind of the top two that were getting all that attention. And even still, um, you know, it was okay. Well, I, I kind of have heard of Tajay Spears as of the cotton bowl, but that was really where people had, started to pay attention to any of the guys on Tulane's roster. Whereas uh, you see really just the importance of sustaining success and why it's really important and probably more important than the first year is the second year after that success where, yeah, they had the greatest single season turnaround in college football history, but was that a fluke? Was that because of these two guys, for example, Tajay and Dorian and all those guys that moved on. And so there was still a little bit of a chip on your shoulder mentality this year with the two lane team. And it didn't end the year like they wanted to, but winning 11 games after winning 12 games, uh, the most, um, I don't know if it was the most in school history uh, with the 98 year, but uh, again, two and 10 to 12 and two is one thing. But if you don't follow that up, you know, if Tulane won six games this year, I think we would really be having a very different conversation about all of this. Um, We might not even be talking about the Senior Bowl and the Combine. But instead, Michael Pratt was the first player to be invited to the Senior Bowl. That really stuck out as something worth noting that Tulane is on the map now. And it wasn't that shocking that all of these coaches and scouts were in attendance for Tulane's Pro Day. And that really benefits these guys that weren't able to get invited to all these other showcases. Guys, on the O-line, you know, you had Cameron Wire participating, Sincere Hainsworth, and Prince Pines. And that ability, again, to do those one-on-one -on -one drills for scouts to see how they stack up, how they test, how they measure for the defensive backs to be able to show their ball skills in real time um, and doing those types of position drills. Because you have guys like, again, Lance Robinson, Jarius Monroe, all of the ball skills and interceptions between the two of them if they had seven interceptions between those two, 17 pass breakups. Then you look at Cam Pettisflow, what he was able to do at that anchor role for Tulane. You look at AJ Hampton, who's just such a smart player, such a really good coverage guy and has played against that really big competition. These are all guys that I've had on these before the whistle episodes. And I know these things about these guys. I wasn't surprised to see that they tested well, but to see that that validation from last year is still really coming in twofold where these guys are really getting the attention that they deserve. And someone I haven't even gotten to at this point was Valentino Ambrosio, who he might not get drafted, but it really doesn't matter for kicker. I think in terms of looking at kickers that I've come across, not really that many in my life. Valentino Ambrosio is just so, his head is just so calm and steadfast. And you know, he just always stuck out to me that he really is unfazed. And if you ask me, that's the most important quality that you need in a kicker. And he's always just been so cerebral, always so thoughtful about his process. Whenever I've talked with him about changing, you know, how he warms up during games, sometimes feeling like that was a little too much uh, throughout the game, but just really after being injured, feeling like he needed to keep his leg warm, telling me that he was, you know, meditating a lot last year. It was something I got into and thanked him at pro day as a result. It's really helped my sleeping out, but just always been so mentally calm and for any position that was as awkward as you could ask for in a facility that you don't even have the wind or the sounds of the outdoors and all of the other drills and tests stopped. And it was just all of us watching Valentino Ambrosio kick field goals. And, you know, you could literally hear a pin drop. And then they asked him to do some kickoffs. And we were all, I mean, the hang time, we all started getting out our phones to time it and the sound that the ball was making when he connected with it, talking with them afterwards He's really never done kickoffs before. It was not something he was really expecting to do. And it, he was almost thankful that he didn't really have that much time to think about it. Um, But he really was just pointing out to me, looking at Justin Tucker, looking at Cairo Santos, guys that went undrafted. And yet that's really what happens for kickers. Um, More often than not, it's very rare to see a kicker get drafted in today's age or, uh, you know, a punter for that matter. 
but getting onto a roster and then just being able to stick. And you see teams cycle through kickers like nothing when guys just aren't hitting. And so it, it, for any position group, the ability to be ready and stay ready, that's something that really is there for kickers. But you, know, you look at Valentino Ambrosio and the fact that he never missed an extra point for Tulane. He holds all of these records for these guys. Um, see if I can grab them while I'm on here. Um, you know, he's first all time in field goal for percentage, making 84.2% of his kicks. And he's first in all time extra point percentage with, again, 100% of the points made. You look back at the Cotton Bowl, you look at all of the guys that are still on this team and all of the critical moments that they had during that game. But the fact of the matter is, if Valentino Ambrosio doesn't make that extra point, Tulane goes to overtime at best. Um, you know, they might still win the game in overtime, but he also kicked a pretty decent field goal in that game as well. And so it shows the importance of having a really strong kicker on the team. But one of the things I did as my final prep for pro day was just going back and watching the final four minutes of that cotton bowl game. And it really just never fails to get old the entire time. Just how mentally ready all three phases of the game were for that moment where you can criticize the, you know, the defensive backs for how they played in coverage. I've also never seen a th quarterback throw like Caleb Williams in my life. And then you think about Jarius Monroe's interception. You think about some critical tackles towards the end of that game that led to uh, field goal opportunities instead of touchdowns for them. And it being a one point margin that really made the difference. But when special teams needed to execute, they executed when the defense had to make that one stop. They not only did that, but gave some land yap with a safety and two points at that. And then the offense, they had to make two touchdowns in four minutes left in the game. That first drive was something like two plays, 23 seconds. And Michael Pratt, I think, had made two completions in that game up until those final couple of drives. But when you ask these guys at Tulane to, when the going gets tough in those critical moments with the clock winding down, there was no timeouts left, and you have to make two fourth down conversions. Michael Pratt got sacked twice on that final drive. He converts one with his legs converts a fourth and 11 or something on the 22 yard completion to Alex Bauman. It was just all the phases of that team, the offensive line, the way they all marched down the field in order to get there before time expired. They only had to spike the ball one time in that final drive, but those are really the intangibles that you're looking for from guys. And you can see that in Tulane that they've been able to win in those critical moments and that it wasn't just a fluke that it wasn't just this magical game, although it very much was, but now we're not having to scream success from the mountaintops anymore. And it's been very easy to cover this off season for Tulane. And it just continues to show the legacy of these guys. Um, the ease at which John Sarmal has said quarterbacks were calling him because of what Michael Pratt was able to do at Tulane. And you no, know, he's very well going to be the first Tulane quarterback to be drafted since JP Lawsman in, in 2004, I want to say, um, who went in the first round. Um, there's been a few quarterbacks that have gone on for Tulane. Michael Pratt's broken pretty much every record for all of those guys. But to have 16 prospects where you can credibly make an argument for a lot of them to be able to make a benefit on an NFL roster and to be able to see them all just get together one last time and something that I was able to do as an observer that I wasn't necessarily able to do during Pro Day last year was just spend time with these coaches and watch how much it really means to them. And these guys that they've really cultivated over these last few seasons, all coming down to this, this one day and this one moment where you get a few tries here and there to perform and, and get these numbers to as best as you can. But it's really, you know, watching your kind of children grow up and move on. You can see a lot of that in those coaches. And so it was just really special to be able to see that and feel like that chapter, you know, of this two lane legacy, that was kind of the final remnants of that where Yes, you still have some guys that because of the COVID year are still over here, but with the quarterback and head coach turnover, you know, this this was an era of Tulane football that to me, that was really the final day of it ending on pro day. Um, and it's been a really, really special one at that. It's one that I think you're going to hear more than one, two, three players called throughout the NFL draft this season. And then when you're looking at Tulane as this team where we're talking about them being in the conversation for the college football playoffs, you look at how they've been able to do in the draft last season and then how they're being looked at this year, whatever these guys are able to go on and do, they're not just the school that is existing in Louisiana alongside LSU at this point. Not to you know compare or contrast here one or the other, but 
Tulane has really made their mark in the city of New Orleans and to me nationally as a brand and that more than anything stuck out at Pro Day and I just continue to be very grateful to cover what I consider to be chapter two of this brand new era of Tulane football.